<laughs> All right, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. When you find that, stand your feet. We'll read the Word of God together. i got to find it first. There we go. All right. <clears throat> If you're there, say amen. 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 All right. Early in the morning, David left the flock with a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle position, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle line, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Wimps. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will... Ex- I don't know why I laugh. Every time I read that, I laugh. Is that a blessing? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, that's a different sermon. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his... Stop it. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? Is there not a cause? He has turned away to someone else, or he turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter, and the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from his flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of those because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I can't go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with the sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And, this Philistine, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the, fe- of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and those gathered there will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. I pray today, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us, comfort us. Lord, encourage us to live the life that you've purposed us to live as the people you have designed us to be, your children for your glory. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our Lord in heaven. <clears throat> Last week we talked a little bit about living a life that was not your life. I talked about how I had grown up in a, a family where my father left at age seven, my aunts and uncles really heavily invested in my life. But as I spent time with them, they would share with me what they thought and who they thought I should be in the future, which career path I should go down. Um, and in a sense, they were trying to mold me into who they were, very wealthy and very well-off uh, type of business people, from lawyers and so forth to heads of companies. And unbeknownst to them, they knew no better. They didn't know the Lord, and I didn't know that the Lord at that time and I didn't know the Lord had a plan for me beyond what we were doing there in that situation I thought I would just go to school and become something that made a lot of money and that was life that's what the goal of life was was to eat drink be merry right have a lot of money serve yourself but God had a different plan for my life because he has a purpose for each of us each of us are uniquely gifted, uniquely designed, crafted by the Lord himself in our mother's wombs, put together. God fashions our lives. He plans every day for our lives, even yet before we step into one of them. God's plans can never be thwarted. Amen? The Lord does as he pleases, the Bible says. And for that I am thankful. But it's very hard for us, I think, to wrap our minds around the very fact that it's not always greener over the fence. We try to be like people that we're not. We look across the fence, we look at families, we read Facebook, Twitter, we watch Instagram, we watch TikTok, and we're like, man, everybody's life is so much better than mine. I need to start trying to be like so-and-so. And we find ourselves falling into this trap of not truly embracing who we are and who we've been created to be in the Lord. We're allowing the world and the enemy of this world to drift us and to push us in a lane that we were never designed to run in. And it's easy to do. David, be careful. As you graduate, you'll want to emulate and be like certain preachers. Preachers go through it all the time. We get out of seminary and we're like, you know what? We haven't preached that much. It's time to start listening to other preachers. And what do you do? You find the best preachers out there. And before you know it, you're trying to be like a Tony Evans or a Jim Cimbala. But I got news for all of us. There's only one Tony Evans. There's only one Jim Cimbala. There's only one Piper, right? And for many of us, thank the Lord, right? There's only one of them. God's never asked us or will ask us, why were you not a better Moses? Or why were you not a better Joseph? He'll look at you and say, why weren't you you? Why weren't you the one that I created you to be? <laughs> and so the enemy is always trying to get us to live a life that is not our life. Always having us gaze over the fence and look at where we perceive it to be better. I need to be more like this person. I need to be more like that. That family is really knocking it out of the park. How do you know? I mean, think about it. How, how do you know? Look at number 52. How do you know? Jason, how? You don't. Everybody looks good on the outside. Look at your neighbor and say, you look good. Well, don't look to your neighbor. Look to your spouse, okay? Just kidding. We do. We look fine on the outside, right? Relatively good. But on the inside, you have no idea what's going on inside of our hearts. We are messed up. We're broken. Our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And yet we walk around with this facade. Jesus, as we talked about last week, he's very comfortable with who he was. Why? Because the Father ripped the heavens open at the beginning of his ministry, at his baptism, before he had done anything, any miracles, saved anybody, gone to the cross, done anything before Jesus even started. The heavens rent open, the Bible says in the, in the, in the Greek. Tore open, and the voice of God was heard. This is my Son, in whom I am I love and I'm well pleased, right? I love him, I'm well pleased. He was dearly loved before he did anything. He was good enough before he did anything. And Jesus was secure in that, and therefore he was able to live his ministry and his mission for the Father without care or concern of what everybody thought or said about him. That'd be a really freeing life, wouldn't it, to, 
to live life without caring what anybody thinks or says about you. One word from somebody can derail your entire week, right? A few words from people in your past have derailed your entire life and you're still living under the label that somebody has given you years ago when it's not true. Who defines who we are? The Lord. Where do you find your value? In your job? In your car? In your spouse? In your children? No, you find your value in the Lord. Who does the Lord say you are? You're a dearly loved child. You are dearly loved and you are good enough. Apart from Him, your best righteousness is what? Yeah, filthy rags. Look, look that one up in the Hebrew. Filthy rags. <clears throat> but the enemy always wants you to think that you need to be something different. The enemy is constantly trying to get you to take your eyes off the author and perfecter of your faith and look at the world and look at other people and evaluate yourself against other people when God says, you know what you need to be evaluating yourself against? Nothing. You need to be in a relationship with me and I will give you, I will give you the definition of who you are. I will place you in the race lane that I have purposed for your life and you will run free like a bird in the air. You will run and soar on wings like eagles and you will be successful because the battle is not yours. The battle is of the Lord, and yet we go out fighting everybody else tooth and nail, and we stop and fail to, we, we fail to stop and realize that this is more than just physical. There is a spiritual dimension to your life. And if all you do is live in the physical realm, you will live just like Saul. <clears throat> Saul lived for himself, did he not? He lived for himself. He lived to please other people. He got upset and fearful of other people when things weren't working right, and he caved into people. He didn't spend time with the Lord. He didn't know the Lord's word. He didn't obey the Lord's word. It was all about him. It was all external. He had no idea who he was created to be, even though he was hand-chosen by the Lord to be the king of Israel Saul missed out on a lot as we'll see in these passages so the challenge today is to ask yourself am I really being true to who God created me to be am I satisfied with who God has made me to be and the life that God has given me well I married the wrong no you, you, you married the wrong person I, I live in the wrong state. Sta sta you live in the wrong state. I have too many kids. Oh, Lord, I didn't say that. Uh, really. I don't have enough kids. When we start to question all that we see, we're really ceasing to walk and live by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things unseen. Are you hoping in things unseen in the spiritual realm, or are you hoping for things that you can see? Where is your faith? Are you satisfied with your life? I ask that because as I struggled with who I was supposed to be early on in life and what I was supposed to be and where I was supposed to live and what I was supposed to do, God clarified it as I walked and talked with him, as I kept my focus on the Lord, his word, and where he was using and placing me. It's not by chance that you are where you are today. God has a plan. You just have to start looking spiritually at the matter. I was going to be an airline pilot. God said, no, Jared's going to be an airline pilot. And he pulled me out to be a preacher. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Is he still serving in ministry? He's got a whole bunch of people that he flies with that don't know the Lord, I'm sure. He is intimately tied with people, captains, that don't know the Lord, that he's able to pour into. I'm able to pour into people wherever I go. 
God wants to use my past life as a testimony of his graciousness and mercy that is available to all of you as I share the things God's brought me through and not hide them because God is a living God. Are you satisfied with who God has created you to be? David is called onto the scene here. This text, 1 Samuel 17, is really a lesson theologically of what God has just shown his people back in 1 Samuel 16. If we look back at 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Lord says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. For the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Theological statement stated right there. A truth of God. I do not look at the outward appearance of man. I look at the heart. Boom. Chapter 17 comes on. Now we're going to play this out in real life, guys. Do you believe the very thing I just told you from the mouth of, of the Lord? Do you believe the spiritual concept that I do not look at the outward appearances of anything? I discern the hearts of people. That is the best advice that god can give any of us as we go through the storm saul what did he do he looked at everything externally he looked at the situation he's looking at goliath why does chapter 17 start with the, the description of goliath because god wants us to understand he doesn't care about the outward appearance here is your test are you going to look at the outward appearance of the situation of other people in your life and be so fearful of them Saul that you hide away from the front line where your people your sheep are, are putting up a fight what kind of shepherd are you so chapter 17 begins with a champion named Goliath who was from Gath, came out to the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. Here we go, the outward appearance. He's over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scaled armor of bronze weighing about 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin he was slung over his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, whatever the heck that means. And its iron point weighed about 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. This dude's over nine foot tall, carrying about 200 pounds of armor. Looks pretty scary. Looks pretty intimidating. Here's Goliath. Looks like a transformer. The first breakdancer ever, Goliath, right? And he looks intimidating. And the Bible says that Saul and all of his men were in great fear when the israelites saw this man they all ran from him in great fear verse 24 the enemy wants you to look at the outward appearance of every situation every person and be so fearful that you do not operate in faith any longer faith and fear cannot exist together when you operate in fear, faith is driven out. That's why Saul is sitting at home, at a distance from the front line, because he has ceased to walk in faith with God. God's removed his presence from Saul back in 1 Samuel what, 15, removed it, taken it away from him. He's no longer with Saul. Saul is just now this lame duck in office. But he's fearful because he's looking at the external appearance of Goliath. And he ought to be fearful because he's the king. He is the one that should be going out to fight this individual. And yet he stays home. And David comes onto the scene. David, the absolute opposite of who King Saul is. Verse 20, early in the morning, David left the flocks with the sheep, with a shepherd. David leaves his flock with a shepherd showing himself to be a good shepherd what does Saul do Saul sits at home while his flock is out on the battlefield by themselves and then David comes to town now the Israelites had been saying do you see how this man keeps coming out he comes out to defy Israel the king will give great wealth to the men who kills him 
He will also give him his daughter in marriage, and he will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is the uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? David understands that this is a spiritual battle. He understands what the word of God says in Leviticus, that anyone who defies the living God should be stoned killed wiped out this uncircumcised philistine who is outside of genesis chapter 17's circumcision seal he's outside of the protection of god he's already defeated but yet he's taunting he's taunting god's people to be fearful to be afraid why does the enemy do that why does the enemy constantly taunt us to be afraid of people? David will be, will be hammered by his brother. He'll be ostracized by leaders over him. And he'll be yelled at by the enemy. David is going to have to go through three battles before he even gets to the battle. Because that's the enemy's tactic. If the enemy can make you fearful, faith has to flee, right? Because fear drives out faith. So if the enemy can get you to operate in fear by looking at the circumstances physically and looking at those that are coming at you physically, he's won half the battle. You know how you get when you know somebody's uh, you know, yelling at you and is intimidating and has just really upset you and you get those feelings inside, you don't want to see that person. You don't want to talk to them. You avoid them at all costs. That's the, that's the fear tactic of the enemy. If I can ingrain fear in you, I have won half the battle because you will be so fearful that even if you do decide to come into battle with all that fear, you're going to operate and fight from fear. How many people operate well or fight well when they're ridden with fear? Not too many people. The enemy is going to throw people David's way to try and derail him. And then we're going to see David have to confront somebody that tries to change his life and make him be someone he is not. David's first battle before he even gets to the battle with Goliath comes from his own family members. It's ironic that some of us have been told by our family that we're no good. Some of our own family have said things years ago that you're still playing and rehearsing in your mind about who you are how worthless you are how you won't amount to anything how you could never do anything oh and you think god's going to use you after you did a b and c oh and what about what you did back in 2015 when Eliab, of david's brother oldest brother heard him speaking with the men in verse 28 he burned with anger he burned with anger at him and asked why have you come down here and with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert you little worthless boy you worthless shepherd with few sheep how dare you come down here why did you come down here you're worthless your job is worthless why did you come down here I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch people get killed. Here's the funny thing. Eliab thinks he truly knows David's heart. <laughs> he doesn't know one thing about David. He's mislabeled him in every which way. Every way he's spoken about. His career, who he is, a shepherd, that his heart was not right with the Lord and that he just comes down to watch people kill to have some kind of entertainment like he's going to a hockey game just for a car race for the crashes. You didn't come down here to watch anybody win. You just come down to watch us get defeated and people die. He knew nothing about David. Why? Because Eliab was operating again from the physical, judging man from the outside. So those people that have put you down and belittled you, do they truly know your heart? David had a heart after God. David was God's chosen man who had a heart after God. Eliab knew nothing about it, but yet David was hearing these words from his own family member. And David stood there and he took it because Eliab meant to hurt David. 
But David, staying cool and calm and walking in step with the Spirit of God, did not allow the enemy to to get him to step out of the Spirit and walk in the flesh, which produces death. David didn't allow the hurt that Eliab was going to throw at him to hinder him from what he knew God had called and prepared him to do his entire life. David was secure in who God made him to be. Absolutely secure. But here, David is having to fight a battle before he even gets to the real battle. And so the enemy has caused some of you to sit on the sideline and be hurt by the words of other people who truly do not understand your intention of your heart as aligned with the Lord. And I would say, are you willing to be free from that? The fear of man is a trap and a snare. They don't label who you are or give you your value. The Lord God Almighty does. And David was secure, just like Jesus was secure in his father's love. David was secure in who he was, what he was doing, and what was before him because he walked in step with the Lord. Had David have gotten out of character there and not realized what the enemy meant for evil but God meant for good, if David would have just walked out of character and walked in the flesh, he would have never been able to go fight. Goliath but he stayed calm and reserved kind of let it roll off his back because he had a better purpose he said what have I done verse 20 can't I even speak is there not a cause the King James or the new King James says is there is there not a cause Do you see that? David was fighting the cause of God. David was fighting the cause of making sure his God was honored and that the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel and that God fights your battle. Isn't there a, aren't we fighting the same cause? No. Eliab and Saul and all of those guys were being led to serve man. Everything that they were going to give as a benefit of winning this fight was for man's benefit. I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you the girl, and you're going to be tax-free. You can have your 5013. You can start a church, David. Everything was external. Everything was material. They had nothing. They were not on the same cause. They weren't fighting the same cause of God, the spiritual cause, to honor God and let people know that there's a God in heaven. Is there not a cause? But David didn't let his own brother stop him. David and his conversation was overheard by Saul. And so David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. It's interesting because Saul was waiting for someone to go fight him, but now he gets David to go and fight him. Unfortunately, it's a little shepherd boy. So for Saul, it still doesn't look all that good because Saul is still looking Externally, Here's this little boy coming to fight Goliath. Saul replied, here's the second attack that David has in his life. First it was his own family, now it's going to be superiors over him. Saul replied, you are not able, in verse 33, to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been fighting, and he's been a fighting man since his youth. (laughs) How do you feel when superiors over you degrade you? Or belittle you, belittle your your job, your career skills, belittle who you are. Have you ever ever had somebody at your job belittle you that was over you? Again, David is fighting more battles before he even gets to the battle line because the enemy is desperately trying to take David out of the fight spiritually so that no one will know that there is a God in heaven and that no one will know that God is the one who fights your battles. And so even Saul, looking at the whole picture from the outside, oh, you're just a little boy. This dude's been you know, knocking it out of the park since he was a little kid. He's now nine foot tall. There's no way you're going to be able to win this one, David. And David goes into what I think we all need to realize is that God has prepared each and every one of us for the battle today and the battle to come your entire life. 
Everything that you've gone through, everything that you've faced, everything that God has brought you through has been so you are prepared for future battles with the enemy. David goes on. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Even though you see me only as a shepherd boy, God was using my vocation, my place on the backside of a mountain with sheep to shape me for this very day, this battle. I have fought Goliath already in the form of lions and bears. I am capable because I have seen the Lord deliver me from the hands or the mouth of lions and bears. You mistake me for a little boy, but God's prepared me all this time for meeting Goliath. And that should be an encouragement to each and every one of us. All that you've gone through, the reason you went through this was to get you here. The reason you got here and you had to go back and do some more work in the fields with the, with the Lord is because he has not, he's not finished with you. And he knows what's coming down the line. So when you get here, he's forming and shaping you for the next battle to come. God, all along your life, I don't care if you're 10 or if you're 110, God in every situation is shaping you for the battles yet to come. You just have to know them spiritually. You have to stop looking physically at everything and saying, no, my neighbor's driving me crazy or my spouse or my, my employer. No. These are the lions and bears in your life that are training grounds for what's coming ahead. And many of us miss out on seeing God work in our lives because we stop looking at things spiritually and we only see things physically. And you see what God does in everybody else's life who follows faithfully the Lord by faith, but you never grab hold of it yourself because you're too set like Saul and you look only and you freak out when the circumstances look overwhelming. Well, God is still on the throne, amen? And his plans prevail. You just have to keep your eyes focused on the author and finisher, perfecter of your faith. Saul saw him as a boy. David knew, no, 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 you miss out. You, you're missing what God's done in my life. God has prepared me spiritually for this battle through tending sheep and fighting lions and bears. David makes it past these three battles or these two battles before he gets to the real battle. And here Saul is now going to try and shape and form him into who he thinks David should be. Because Saul only operates from the physical. He's only looking at matters from a man-centered point of view and he says you know what david you're a little teeny boy i'm going to help you out be careful when people say i'm going to help you out especially if somebody says that you need to be something that you're not i'm going to give you my armor and here saul tries to give david his armor and his shield and his sword to fight a battle that's spiritual in nature what does david do he puts it on and he clunks around like, you know, a, a baby wearing a, a down coat. Just can't do it. Can't see out of it. You ever put clothes on a kid that are too big? A little Carter, we put these onesies on him with the footies and all that. And they're like 17 sizes too big because somebody handed them down to us. And the poor kid, you can't see his arms. He can't crawl because his hands can't hit the ground. It's just all slipping. And he's chewing on the end because there's this big long tassel that he, he starts chewing. He can't, he can't be who he is. He can't crawl because he's sliding all over the floor because he's got this stupid outfit on that makes him look like Bozo the Clown. And it's too big for him. It's not what he's supposed to be dressed in. David can't operate in somebody else's life. David can't operate as somebody else. Though it may look good on the other side of the fence, that's not your side of the fence that God has you on. God has you on this side of the fence. This is your life. This is who God created you to be. Don't you dare try to put on somebody else's life. What would it look like if you stopped for just a moment and said, you know what? I'm learning this about myself. I'm not being true to who God's created me to be. I've got to stop being like A, B, or C. You're not your neighbor. You're not the parent that you read about on Instagram. You're not what your family has conformed you and molded you to be. You are who God's created you to be. David shed 
that armor quicker than you can say, I'm out of here. And what does that show? It shows David's rejection as it shows God's rejection of Saul and all of his ways. David is the good shepherd, leaving his flock with a shepherd before he goes to the battle line. Saul did not. Saul trusted in the outward appearance of things. David did not. Saul thought that David needed the help from armor and weapons formed by the hands of man. David said, no, no, not for me. I'm going to take something that's formed and fashioned, a stick and a stone by my Father in heaven. Everything that David did was God-centered. Everything that Saul did was man-centered. And David taking off that armor was a, a stark rejection of all that Saul stood for. And that's exactly what God had told us the chapters before. I have rejected you, Saul, because you do not live by faith. You do not follow me. You're not in a relationship with me. I am calling somebody who has a heart after me, and he calls David up. And David, getting to the battle, is ostracized. And it's a, it's a tough fight to stay in the course. But if you stay the course, you will see God work miraculously in your life. David goes and picks up five stones, right, and a, a stick. And I don't know if they had surgical rubber back then, you know. I don't know what he used. Maybe it was, I don't know, a camel hair all weaved. I don't know what he used, but he did. He grabbed a stick slingshot and some stone why did he use stones anybody he used stones because David knew God's word intimately he knew his father intimately in heaven and he knew back in Leviticus it said anybody who defies the living God must be stoned that's why David picked up the stones because everything he did lined up with a faith walk with God. He trusted God for everything. And he picks up those stones and he begins to run. And now Goliath is waiting for somebody to come in close quarters because he's all geared up. He can't run. He can't do a sprint. He's all weighed down by 200 pounds of armor. He's got a shield bear with that big rectangle shield in front of him. He's probably like, come on. And he's like, arr, 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 and they advance very slowly. Goliath is set up for close combat. David is set up to get him wherever he can, whenever he can, at a distance, because he's chosen a weapon that can be used from afar. So David begins to run. And Goliath comes out, and he looks David over, and he saw that he was only a boy, only again. Here's the third battle before the real battle. Only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Verse 43, he said to David, Am I a dog? It's actually worse than that. He says, am I a male prostitute that you come at me with sticks? <laughs> and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give you your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. It's over. <laughs> the battle was over before it even started. David just had to get through the many battles that the enemy throws your way to stop you from being successful in the battle that he knows the Lord fights because the enemy has watched the Lord fight battle after battle after battle and you think he doesn't put on the glasses of faith and watch what God will do stay focused on God this day here's the cause this day that that, that David is fighting for this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head today I will give your carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel and those gathered there will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands and he takes out that stone and he chucks it at goliath bam right smack in the forehead goliath falls over boom and what does david do he runs over and he cuts his head off to kill goliath because if you don't kill the enemy fully in your life he will come back to haunt you he will come back to haunt you just like saul let agag live from the agagites remember that 
And people are like, well, no, he, didn't Samuel kill him? Yes, he did. But if you go to Esther chapter 3, verse 1, what does it talk about? Haman is from the line of the Agagites. How in the world, 600 years later, if all the Agagites were killed back in 1 Samuel, how in the world was Haman a descendant of them? Because Saul was so blind by his sin because he didn't eradicate all of the enemy as he was told by God that the enemy continued to live on. King Agag wasn't the only one left. There were obvious others still alive. Otherwise, Esther chapter 3, verse 1 would be a lie. David understood the enemy must be eradicated fully and completely. And so he didn't just say, well, you know what? I knocked him down. He went over there and cut him to death. Many of us are still entertaining the enemy in our lives because we will not eradicate certain areas of the enemy. We won't finish the job. Walk by faith and finish the job. Get the enemy out of your life and watch what God will do. Because David followed faithfully. David alone was able to see God work in miraculous ways. Look at that. Saul had to just observe. Israel, was they were, they were re-energizing their faith, but again, they weren't part of what God did. David was the only one because he rejected everything of man and grabbed hold of everything of God and walked faithfully with God. He was satisfied with who he was. He was satisfied how God made him. He was content where God had placed him. And he alone, because he was fighting the same cause that God wanted fought, that everybody would know that there's a God in heaven and that God fights the battle, David alone was able to see God work miraculously in his life. Man, if you're waiting for God to work miraculously in your life, get back to trusting God and not expecting man to save you. God will fight your battles. There are only... 7 billion people in the world? No two people, even if you're identical twins, have the same fingerprints. Isn't that amazing? If you, if you read how fingerprints are formed, I mean, it's like mind-blowing. But out of all of us, there are no two people that have the same fingerprints. Now, some claim but if you look intimately and intricately and deeply beyond what a microscope can see, there are no two fingerprints that are the same. Why is that? Because God's created you to be you. That you might not be mistaken for somebody else and go, look, but I am that person. No, 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 no. You're, Steve, who I created you to be. How many of us would be free if we just accepted who we are in the Lord? Put off all the voices from family, from superiors over us, to the enemy that screams to us every night and taunts us. How many of us would be free to live a life of faith? How many of us would be able to see God work miraculous ways in our lives if we would just trust Him instead of man? Do you know who God's created you to be? Do you know the purpose that God has given you? Or are you still trying to clothe yourself as Saul? What are you realizing today about yourself that you're like, you know what? I'm really beginning to realize that I'm this or that I need to let this go. I do pray that you truly would be free from the lie that you are not good enough and that you have to be like your neighbor or somebody else's spouse or somebody else's child. God's got a plan for you and you alone. He's purposed it before you were even born. He's planned your days before you even had one of them fulfilled. He knows you. Do you know him? If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, he died on the cross. He finished it. He paid your penalty. He stood in your place. The perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world offers you a life of purpose, power, protection, and provision all by simple faith 
in the finished work on the cross. How do I become a saved, born-again, blood-bought, blood-washed believer of Jesus Christ? How do I become a child of the King? You understand that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You understand that Jesus is God's one and only Son who takes away the sins of the world, that He died on the cross for you. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord for salvation and forgiveness shall be saved. Ask Him to save you. Ask who? Ask Jesus, God's Son, to be your Lord and Savior. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins, and He will. And at that moment, He makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone, the new has come. He sets you on a trajectory of a faith journey with God. That if you keep your eyes focused on the author and perfecter of your faith, you will begin to see Him do miracles in your life. No longer will you have to fight your battles by yourself, for the battle is of the Lord. Won't you grab hold of Jesus today? Stop pretending that you're someone you're not. Let him show you who you truly are. The victory is at hand. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. Lord Jesus, thank you for the encouragement. God, I pray today that someone would be freed from feeling insecure and inadequate. God, you have fearfully and wonderfully designed each of us. And for that, we are ever thankful. Father, I pray today that you are glorified, that you are honored and that more and more people begin to realize there is a living God. His name is Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing a song of invitation.